Welcome to lecture 14 of Statistical Rethinking 2023. We're going to pick up right where we left off in the previous lecture. But first, um, let me reassure you that all this highly technical stuff that we're doing this week in these lectures is really a necessary part of drawing the owl. Uh, we start with the full picture in our mind, uh, some plan of what we want to draw, but then it's a lot of detail, just like drawing a real owl. You have to work in layers and there's just no way to avoid that kind of work. And so it's my responsibility to teach you about the little techniques that people uh, don't realize you used when they see the final product. Uh, I want to assure you it's worth it uh, to have reliable results uh, and see uh, the final image that you had in your mind to start with, uh, your estimate, uh, your completed owl. Where we stopped last time was working through uh, drawing the Bangladesh owl, uh, this 1989 fertility survey in Bangladesh. And I had sketched out a, um, a kind of playful dag for you. Uh, it's, it's not completely ridiculous. It's missing some things that I had trimmed off so we could have a, 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 good, uh, a good flow. Uh, the first thing we had accomplished last time was just to think about the varying effect strategy for estimating the uh, unobserved district effects uh, so that we could have a description, uh, stratify contraceptive use by each district. Um, and this is what we got from that. This variation across districts uh, divided by rural uh, and urban is where we ended up in the, in the end. Um, and you can see that uh, there's, in general, more contraceptive use in urban areas uh, than in rural areas. Um, uh, there's also less data uh, in the urban areas, and so the uncertainty intervals are, are larger. Uh, and this brings up this issue uh, Rural and urban are features of the clusters. I'll say that again. Rural and urban are features of the clusters. The clusters are the districts. They are subgroups in the data in which you have repeated observations. And then features are aspects of these groups. And, they're, and they can typically vary by these groups. And often our research depends upon a good description of that variation, both for descriptive and causal inference uh, questions. Um, and where I ended last time was trying to convince you that when we um, stratify contraceptive use in this sample by district and by uh, urban and rural, uh, you get this plot on the right here where um, each point is a district and there's a strong positive correlation between contraceptive use in rural area, the rural part of a district and the urban part of a district. And maybe you're like, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because there are common effects in the district. Uh, shared by the rural and urban areas. Uh, but this means there is certainly information on the table that we have not exploited because the if you only knew the rural contraceptive use in a district, you could make a better guess of the urban contraceptive use if you knew this correlation existed. So it's not you knowing that matters, it's the golem, it's the model. And so in this lecture, we're going to focus on building golems that can learn the correlation among features and exploit that correlation to learn faster by doing partial pooling across the features. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes there are big gains to come from this, especially when some of the features are undersampled relative to others. And then the partial pooling can be very important. So here's the overview, and then we're going to work through uh, a detailed example using the Bangladesh data again. Uh, to add correlated features, um, we're going to start adding uh, multiple dimensional priors. So uh, the idea is for each cluster type in your analysis, you need one prior distribution. And all of the features uh, for that cluster go into the same joint prior. So for example, if you only have one feature, which is what we've um, done in the simplest cases, uh, then you just need a one-dimensional normal distribution. And that's the simple, usually called varying intercepts, um, uh, partial pooling prior that you see on the top right um, there. With two features, uh, like in the example with um, districts uh, uh, where we split rural and urban, now we have two features. Ideally, what we'd want is not two one-dimensional distributions for alpha j and beta j like I did in the previous lecture, but um, a two-dimensional distribution. Uh, 
uh, this multivariate normal, MV normal, sometimes abbreviated simply MVN. Uh, it's a multivariate normal. It's a normal distribution in two dimensions uh, or even more uh, in which um, we have two means and two standard deviations, but also a correlation between the two dimensions. And that correlation will be a parameter that will be learned from the sample, and it will allow partial pooling across the features. And I want to build this up for you and show you the advantages it brings. In general, you're not limited to two. Um, uh, you can go to n features, however many you have, and scale quite large, in fact. Uh, the hard part here is learning associations. You typically need um, much more data to learn the correlations well than you do to learn the means or standard deviations. Means are easy, standard deviations are hard, and correlations are very hard. That's the heuristic. Uh, nevertheless, um, it's worth trying to learn them. And if, you're, if you don't have a, a sample sufficient to learn them, you'll just get the prior back, so that's no harm done. Let me give you a toy animated example before we actually build up the real golem and work through the data example. So I want you to think back to the UC Berkeley admissions example, and this isn't going to be exactly that, but I want you to think about a population of uh, academic departments considering applicants. And um, we have a prior for the population, and this is a, a multi-level model. And there are two features of each department that we're going to try to estimate, uh, the average log odds of admission and then the average difference between um, applications uh, that identify as female or male, right? So the, the horizontal axis is a, like an intercept and the vertical axis is like a slope. It's a difference, it's an effect. And population, there's some population of departments and we don't really know uh, how these features are related. And so we have some vague two-dimensional Gaussian prior and that's what this hill is or these concentric rings you see on the screen it's like looking down on top of a Gaussian distribution in two dimensions and there's no correlation uh, in this Gaussian distribution and then we consider a, a department um, when we haven't seen any uh, application decisions from uh, this department yet uh, it's got a vague prior as well that comes from the population I mean basically anything could happen uh, in this uh, in this particular department um, so we're going to consider five departments, and I just want to run through a cartoon example where we visit each of them in sequence, starting with department one and, and then department five. And first we look at only uh, applications marked male, so we get an estimate of the average log odds of admission, the horizontal axis, and then um, uh, applications marked female, so we get uh, some estimate of the difference, that is the vertical axis. And I want you to watch how the whole screen updates every time we get any data, because this is a multi-level model and the population of departments prior in the upper left is going to update with uh, every time we update a department. So let's visit department one. First thing. So we get some information from department one about their average log odds of admission, the intercept A on the horizontal axis there. And you'll notice that this moves the population prior to the right because uh, there's a very high rate of admissions. So the, this is log odds. So zero means 50-50. Most applicants, the majority of applicants, uh, some 70% of them, I, th I think, uh, are admitted uh, in this department, and that moves the whole thing up. And you'll see, so the, the gray in these plots marks the, uh, the prior, and then the posteriors are shown uh, in blue for the population and in red for the departments. Uh, the blue crosses in the departments are just there as a visual reference uh, for you. Um, okay, uh, a visual reference of where the population um, of departments mean is. Yeah, that's why it's in blue. So I'll say that again. The blue crosses in each department is a visual reference of where the population average is. And you'll see that it moves, uh, tracks the, the plot in the upper left. Okay, now um, uh, that posterior distribution, it has no idea uh, about, about B, about the average difference. Uh, we get some data on that, and it turns out it's, it's also high. Uh, so uh, female applications are advantaged in this department with high admissions rates, um, and we update the posterior there. Now we know a lot about department one, so we've got a, a, a pretty um, tight posterior distribution there. Uh, the other departments are still very vague, but they have updated. And what I want you to notice is the population, posterior distribution in blue, and all the others have tilted up and to the right a little bit, and that's because there's a positive correlation found between uh, A and B in department one, which is the only department we've seen, All right? So let's continue. Now we visit department two. We found we find a, a log odds uh, for, for uh, average admission around one. 
and then uh, we inspect, uh, which is right on the population average. And then we uh, inspect uh, the data to help us estimate B, and we find that that's about average as well. Uh, so that's perfectly consistent with the population prior. Uh, now department three, uh, we look at department three and its estimate uh, is a little bit below the population average, a little bit to the left of the vertical blue bar. And then we estimate B and it's below as well. So this reinforces the idea that there's a correlation between um, uh, the two axes, but between the average log size of admission and the average difference. Uh, and, and so you see you get in, in the population posterior in the upper left, it tilts even more. So this is, this is uh, Bayesian updating, uh, learning the correlation uh, across clusters and so on with department four. It's even lower, has a very low rate of admission and uh, a lower difference uh, as well, or negative difference. Uh, and we get an even steeper correlation in the upper left. Now, before we visit department five, look, it expects a correlation. Yeah, that's the prior in red of what's expected. If you were to make a prediction for what you're gonna find in department five for A and B, you would expect them to be correlated uh, modestly. And then we look, this one has a very low rate. Now I want you to see, looking at the red posterior distribution for department five that's shown there, look where its center is. Its center is below the blue horizontal line. The blue horizontal line is the average population in the population posterior in the upper left. Uh, so. Uh, we haven't seen the information for Department 5 yet that lets us estimate the B, uh, but the, the expectation is that it's lower than average because the A was lower than average. And that's what the partial pooling across features does for us. In a model that doesn't use a joint prior like this, that just has independent Gaussians uh, for A and B, it wouldn't have this prediction that it's below average because it learns nothing across the features. Uh, and then we update. And since it's my example, uh, it, it is indeed uh, below average. Okay, that was meant to give you a kind of cartoon view of what the advantages are and why it makes sense, why it's rational, to use a word that I really don't like, uh, to uh, pool across features. And we get pooling across features only when we use a multivariate prior that includes all those features together and we can learn correlations. So uh, we're back to our problem of estimating the uh, the total causal effect of U, uh, you remember from the DAG on the right, this means we don't include kids because that would block the indirect path uh, according to this DAG. And what we want to do is take the model we had used before for this and add the correlated prior and modify it. Uh, so to remind you, this is the model we had from the previous lecture. This has um, the feature, uh, uh, the urban feature but um, it uses two independent normal priors. And this was the non-centered version. Remember, I promised uh, I'll have a bonus at the end of this lecture where I explain why this non-centering trick works. Uh, but for now, I just take it, it's a bit of a technique that you need to use and mimic um, uh, to get more efficient chains sometimes. <clears throat> and we're gonna modify this now uh, to make it into something that um, is uh, a multivariate uh, uh, prior. So, here is um, the centered version of this same model. And I wanna go back to this one to make the pedagogy a little bit easier. This is the uh, model that is easier to think about conceptually, but it's equivalent to the non-centered uh, model that was on the previous slide. And just to remind you, we have, the, uh, we have an alpha for each district. And in the mathematical version of the model on the right, each alpha J is a normal prior with some unknown mean and standard deviation that we're gonna learn from the sample. And this will give us partial pooling across the alpha J's. And analogously for the beta J's, we've got a normal distribution with some unknown mean beta bar and some standard deviation tau. We're gonna learn those from the sample as we learn the beta J's. And so we'll get partial pooling uh, to improve the estimates of the beta J's. All right, now what we wanna do is we wanna collapse those, that alpha J and beta J, pr those priors together into a joint prior. And that's what we're gonna do now. So the implication uh, when they're independent is that if you plot it out, the posterior, the joint uh, uh, posterior distribution of alpha J's and beta J's or the prior distribution, um, it would look like uh, a perfectly circular hill uh, from the top. This is a, a bivariate normal distribution with no correlation between the dimensions. It looks like a circular hill. 
Um, if we collapse them together into a joint distribution, the possibilities grow. Now we can have correlations between them, and we can model the correlations. And so uh, the way I like to do the notation for a multivariate normal uh, is by splitting it into um, three things that describe its shape. So we're going to talk about this multivariate normal in some detail here if this is new notation for you. On the far left, we have a vector of um, features uh, that are for each unit j. Uh, that is to say, for each district J, there's an alpha and a beta, and they are drawn from a multivariate normal. And so for each district J, they all have this same prior that's on the right, but they get their own alpha and beta values yeah, that are unique to that district. And then the first uh, argument inside of the multivariate normal that determines its shape is a vector of means of the same length as the number of features. So we have alpha bar and beta bar. Then we need a correlation matrix. Uh, this is uh, the correlation matrix needs to have the same dimension as the number of features. So in this case, it's a two by two matrix, which implies actually that there's only one correlation inside of it because we've only got two features, and so there's only one correlation to learn. Uh, but for for larger numbers of features, you get more and more correlation co correlation coefficients to learn, and it can become much more complicated. And then finally, our our familiar vector of standard deviations, one for each feature. And so uh, the idea is that, as I'm trying to illustrate in the graph on the right here, that um, correlated normal distribution be described by that kind of uh, stretched elliptical hill. And uh, if we drew samples from it, which is what the points uh, represent, uh, they would, in uh, the limit, represent this correlation. But in any, fi any finite sample, it could be quite hard uh, to learn the correlation. Let's we'll put this back in the model. So now there's one more thing, one more entity has appeared in this, and it's the correlation matrix R. Uh, and what kind of prior do we assign to a correlation? Uh, th there are many possibilities, and in the stats literature you'll see uh, all of them. Um, my preference, at least for these sorts of simple problems, is to use something called the LKJ uh, uh, family of priors, uh, correlation matrix priors. This is a prior for correlation matrices. Yeah of any dimension, in fact. Um, ours is quite simple. Uh, the LKJ, LKJ um, uh, is, is, comes from the authors of the paper. I say much more about this distribution uh, in the book. If you're interested in details, take a look. Um, what you want to think of it as is it's, it tends to have shapes, uh, as shown in the upper right there. So here for a single correlation coefficient inside of it um, for the shape uh, parameter value 4. Uh, it looks like this uh, gently regularizing hill. So the, the horizontal axis in that plot in the upper right is a correlation. The correlations can vary between minus one and one. And um, uh, the LKJ priors are symmetric. And uh, the shape parameter determines how skeptical the prior is of extreme correlations. And so bigger values are more skeptical of extreme correlations. They pile up uh, more probability mass on the diagonal uh, in the matrix, which means no correlation. And so uh, for four here, um, which is not a special value in any, in any sense, it gives you this kind of hill where it's skeptical of extreme correlations, but it does not rule them out. Uh, sometimes you want tighter ones, sometimes you want looser ones. Um, uh, as always, what we want to do is a prior predictive simulation and see what it looks like because the joint prior the multivariate normal for alphas and betas depends upon all these parameters. It depends upon the priors for alpha bar and beta bar, uh, for, for R, uh, or actually that's a rho, it's a capital rho Greek letter, and uh, sigma and tau all together. So in the bottom right of this slide, what I've done a prior predictive simulation for the Gau bivariate Gaussian distributions that uh, come from, that are specified by all those parameters jointly. And here I've just drawn, I, I forget, maybe a dozen Gaussian distributions, and I've just uh, drawn their 89th uh, percentile ellipse, confidence ellipse, to show you their shapes. And as you can see, um, in this prior, there are a bunch uh, of possible uh, uh, relationships, uh, some with very high correlations, some with very low, um, going in every which direction. Okay, just to remind you again of this, this uh, artistry metaphor, uh, you've got, you start out with this idea of some estimate, and that's the owl. You, you can see it in your mind's eye, right? And now we're um, uh, doing the fine level sketching. Uh, 
to get exactly the sort of effect we want here. And it's really worth doing that kind of work. Uh, so let's take a break now. Uh, you can think that over and review this first half of the lecture. And when you come back, we'll turn this into code. So before the break, I had tried to give you a conceptual understanding of these multivariate normal priors. Now let's actually make the machine. Uh, this is this is the fun part. So here's the code from uh, uh, here's the code for the centered version of this model, which will be conceptually is easier to understand because it'll look much more like the mathematical version on the right. Um, let me walk you through it, uh, the bits in a piece, so you can see the correspondences. Uh, the first thing is we just need to specify a multivariate prior. And so the, the awkward thing about this encoding is that what this means is that we end up with a matrix of parameters because we have 61 districts and each of them has two features, alpha and beta. We want a matrix with 61 rows and two columns to hold all of the varying effects. And that's what I've set up here in the lower part of the model. Um, a matrix, uh, 61 rows, and two columns named V, just for varying effects, and it has a multi-normal distribution with a vector of means that I'm calling A bar, and a correlation matrix rho, and a vector of, of standard deviations called sigma. And so A bar then um, has to be a vector of length 2, and you'll see that it is, and sigma has to be a vector of length 2 as well. And uh, I've given rho, uh, rho is a correlation matrix. That's the type of, ver type of parameter it is. And it has that LKJ core um, prior. And then there's this machinery up top that is meant to uh, map the varying effects onto the uh, A and B parameters in the, in the linear model up top. This is just for our convenience. You could use the elements of the V matrix in the linear model but it makes the model harder to read and it makes posterior predictions harder to process. And so often I do this kind of uh, remapping, redefining the effects in terms of other parameters. And so what the code I've highlighted here does is it just takes the first column of V and it assigns it to the vector A. I remember there's 61 alphas. Um, and it takes the second column of V and assigns it to the symbol B. And so there's 61 betas. And that's just for convenience. There's no, no statistics going on there. And then we get to have our same convenient and, and interpretable linear model uh, up top. Um, right, so here's our LKJ uh, uh, core prior that I had mentioned before. And um, again, there's nothing special about the, the value 4, but it creates that gentle regularizing hill. And you should, when you're learning this, try other values. Um, try very large values and see if you can squash any posterior correlation. Try very low values um, and uh, uh, see if you can make correlations larger. You run this model. It does an OK job, but it's not very efficient as Markov chains go. Um, this is not broken in any sense, but you're likely to get a couple of warnings about chains with um, some problems, maybe even a scary message about divergent transitions. And this happens a lot with multi-level models, as I mentioned in the previous lecture. And, uh, and again, I promised I'd explain in a bonus round. Uh, and there's lots in the textbook about this as well. Um, uh, what's going on here, the, the main problem is the second element of the sigma vector. This is the standard deviation of the, of the beta parameters, if you will. And you'll see that one's having a problem. Uh, it has uh, low effective uh, sample size and um, a larger r hat. And you see in that plot in the upper part of this slide, I've plotted the each point is a parameter. A lot of parameters in this model, right? Because we've got um, two features and there's 61 parameters for each feature. Uh, I've plotted them. And then for each, we've got the uh, number of effective samples on the horizontal and then the R hat on the vertical. And um, ideally, they would all be uh, uh, to the right of that red line, which is 10% uh, of the, an effective sample size, which is 10% of the total sample size, right? So 200. Uh, 
and uh, you don't want parameters near that area. It's kind of a danger zone, right? This is just a heuristic, uh, but you want to stay out of the danger zone. Um, and you want lower R hats too. You want to be on the uh, piled up on the bottom. Okay, if you ran this chain longer, it'd be fine. Uh, actually, it's not broken at all, but it can be made more efficient. And this comes back to our centering versus non-centering thing. You can create non-centered versions of multivariate normals as well. And this is often essential for getting these sorts of models to run. So to remind you, here's the, here's the correlated varying effects version of the, of the uh, contraception model with the centered priors. And remember, it's centered because there are parameters inside the prior. Yeah, it's a, uh, there are priors for priors. Uh, but uh, just like with one-dimensional normal distributions, we can factor out all those parameters and um, reconstitute the whole thing and have something which is technically the identical mathematical model, but which samples more efficiently in the computer. <clears throat> and here's what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to explain this in the bonus, not in this main lecture, because I think doing so in the main lecture distracts and overwhelms from the conceptual lessons about this stuff. And this is also the kind of trick that you can use without understanding, uh, because you can copy the code and put it in. You need the conceptual understanding to know um, how to piece it together, but you don't have to understand exactly why it works. I know it's a weird thing for a statistics teacher to say, uh, but it's true. And eventually you will come around and uh, learn the technical issues, but you don't have to in the beginning. Um, but I, what I want you to see, the part I've highlighted in red, is we've swapped out our multivariate normal for alpha and beta with the Z thing, or Z thing, if you will. And Z is a matrix. Um, it's like that uh, matrix in the code. Uh, it has um, uh, 61 rows and two columns, uh, and that's what the JK subscripts are for a district J and a feature K. And every element of this matrix is assigned the same prior, just a standard normal distribution. So there are no parameters inside the prior. None of the priors have parameters inside of them now. But then we have to do all this extra nonsense to reconstitute the effects, and that's what the code just above it is, all the deterministic relationships, including that line of matrix algebra where we build up V from this um, diag sigma uh, LZ. Um, uh, it's, it, yeah, it's just a way of, of uh, building the pieces back together uh, th uh, through just the simple logic of how Z-scores work. But it's matrix algebra, so it's compact. I realize models like this are a bit terrifying. It's like you've dredged up uh, some old god uh, from the ocean and it, it's flailing its probability tentacles at you and will devour you in the world. Uh, but uh, don't worry, the, you get used to this stuff very fast and this, these sorts of parameter transformations have huge efficiency gains. So again, just like there are many um, annoying features of artistry, there are many annoying features of methods, uh, but uh, there's nothing to do except um, tame the beast. Yeah. And in this case, it's actually not that bad. Uh, so we have a code version uh, of this model, and here it is uh, in, the, in the working code. Now, of course, keep in mind, as many of you know, in standard software packages, all of this artistry is buried away from you, and you would never know it exists. But I feel like it's my duty to tell you that it exists um, because. All those software packages use defaults, and sometimes the defaults are wrong for you. And so you get a lot more power out of that. And also, uh, seeing these examples of how the machine works, uh, eventually, if you stick with this and you become a methodologist, you get really good at this and you can build your own machinery uh, that do custom things. And in the lectures uh, next week, I'll show you some examples. But anyway, uh, let's analyze this code a bit and let me show you what's going on and how it corresponds to the non centered um, correlated varying effects prior. Uh, so the First bit of this, of course, are the priors. And to remind you, there are no parameters inside any of these priors. We have this Z or Z matrix on top. It, um, uh, well, sorry, I misspoke. It's inverted from the, uh, the others, or transposed, rather. Um, it has uh, two rows, one for each feature, and 61 columns, one for each district. And every element of this matrix is assigned a normal 0, 1 prior. And, uh, and then we... The rest is basically the same, except there's this uh, thing where uh, the correlation matrix rho has been replaced by a parameter, which is L underscore rho, and this is a and its type is 
is uh, Koleski or, or Cholesky uh, factor core. Uh, and this is a particular factorization of a matrix called a Koleski factor. It's used a ton in statistics because it's very efficient. And uh, this is just part of the wizardry that, that makes the non-centering uh, work and makes it um, uh, efficient. And, but it still uses the LKJ uh, correlation matrix. Priors uh, determine the same way. It's just uh, with the Koleski tacked on the end, but it has all the same prior properties. It's not a new distribution. Uh, and then sigma is the familiar issue as well. Um, all of this stuff then, there's this machinery up here, which is all deterministic math. It's just reassignment and adding and multiplying things, which reconstitutes our familiar alpha and beta vectors uh, uh, from these things. So the, the third line there is this uh, matrix algebra. I have a convenience function called composed non-centered, which takes the uh, necessary elements, the sigma, the Koleski factor for the correlation matrix, and the matrix of uh, standardized varying effects, uncorrelated standardized varying effects, the Z or Z matrix, and then does the necessary um, uh, linear algebra to make the V uh, varying effects matrix with 61 uh, uh, rows and two columns. And then we put the means back in uh, on the two lines above that. And then we're right back to our familiar linear model. The bit that's in the code that you don't see on the right is this final line to convert the Koleski factor to a correlation matrix because uh, mortals cannot interpret Koleski factors. They're, they're derived from a correlation matrix, but they don't contain correlations necessarily. So what we want reported in the posterior distribution is usually the correlations because we might actually have research questions that um, hinge upon those correlations. And so this last line just does that. Okay, code aside, here's what we get. Uh, we get a posterior distribution for the correlation between the features. And there's a reasonably strong negative correlation uh, between the alphas and betas across districts in this. And, uh, and I show you here the posterior distribution in red. Almost all the probability mass is below zero. And it, just for comparison, I show you the prior. It's often nice to compare the prior distribution to the posterior to make sure the model learns something from the sample, right? Um, and the consequence of this is if you plot up the posterior means for the alphas and betas from the correlated varying effects model, uh, they look like this. And the pink hill there in the middle is the posterior um, uh, bivariate Gaussian distribution for the alphas and betas, the joint prior for them, updated uh, with the sample. And then you see the negative correlation. be nice to compare this to the model that has alpha and beta but ignores the correlation between them just has the independent partial pooling priors that's the one we did in the previous lecture and um, so we plot up the alpha and beta estimates for each district in that case with uncorrelated features and you'll see it looks quite different right so no it's not that they're completely uncorrelated here there is a little bit of a negative correlation uh, but it's not as strong uh, uh, learning the correlation helps a lot because it enables partial pooling across the districts, across features. What consequence does this have, though, on the outcome scale? So these, these alphas and betas are little cogs in the machine. They're not uh, um, easy to relate to the observable outcome because um, any prediction may depend upon both of them simultaneously, and they have joint uncertainty. Uh, so we can look at this a couple ways. You bear with me. Uh, uh, here's a way that we looked at in the previous lecture. We think about in each of these plots uh, on the horizontal axis, we have all the districts uh, arranged from 1 to 61 on the horizontal axis. And then the vertical is the uh, probability that a woman uses contraception in that district. And the red points are rural and the blue points are urban. Um, and so you can see easily that uh, the model has learned that there's more use in urban areas. Um, there's also uh, uh, quite a lot of variation across urban areas. Uh, the top is our new posterior means using correlated features, and the bottom are the previous ones from uh, the previous lecture using uncorrelated features. Now, if you squint, I, I understand, that I have another plot coming, but hang on. Uh, if you squint and you compare the blue points on the top and the bottom, what I want you to see is there's more variation among the blue points on the top than on the bottom. On the bottom, they've been shrunk towards the mean much more aggressively. You'll see that, yeah? They're sort of bunched up more in the same range. Uh, the red points are, are 
relatively similar on the top and bottom, although some of them have moved a bit. So first thing to notice is this has made a difference. It's the right thing to do and it has made a difference. Uh, let's look at this in the outcome space now on the probability scale. So we take the link function and or you just produce posterior uh, predictions for each district uh, in a, for a woman who's living in a rural area uh, and a woman living in an urban area. And that's what this plot shows. Um, here is what this plot would look at for the model that ignores the correlation, right? So I showed you this at the end of the previous lecture to whet your appetite for correlations. You can see the strong correlation. Uh, this correlation arises largely because alpha is in both of these things, right? Um, we overlay the correlated features model and you can see that a lot of the points move uh, sometimes quite substantially. And um, so this has made uh, quite a big impact. Why have they moved? Well, this is because um, of the transfer of information across features. In many of the districts, there's uh, little, if any, information about women in urban areas. But for some of the districts, there's a lot. And then the correlation, the negative correlation between uh, contraceptive use in rural and urban areas within districts uh, can be used to produce better estimates uh, for those districts where there's little information about urban women. And sometimes this moves points quite a lot. What does that negative correlation mean, though, when I say there's a negative correlation? So the negative correlation between um, contraceptive use in rural areas and the difference in contraceptive use in urban areas. I'll say that again. It's a, it's a negative correlation between the amount of contraceptive use in rural areas in a district and the difference uh, uh, to urban women in the same district. And so what the negative correlation means is that when a district has high contraceptive use in rural areas, the urban areas are more similar to it. They're, they're less different, right? So most urban areas have very similar contraceptive use rates in, in this uh, 1989 sample, um, but the rural areas vary a lot across districts. Uh, so we get this uh, movement uh, here that helps quite a lot in updating these things and things have moved a lot. And this is the better model. Um, given all the assumptions. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's estimating the effect of you, uh, and all of that machinery is needed to do that. And uh, um, there's lots of other stuff we could do with this sample, of course. Yeah, uh, we could estimate uh, the direct effect of you as well, and you might want to try this, uh, maybe in a homework problem. And to do that, using your coming back conceptually to the high level, uh, zoom out again and picture the owl in your mind. Yeah. Uh, we're not doing detailed sketching now. If you wanted to do that, you would need a, a little golem that stratifies by kids. Yeah, and there are many, that's a subtle sort of thing to think about too, because uh, what does it mean to stratify by kids? Yeah, uh, the kids is a, is a strange variable. You don't have half a kid, um, but there's no sense in which each kid has to, has to have the same effect. And we need to stratify in some reasonable way um, to to uh, uh, block this mediation. Uh, there's also the effects of uh, kids themselves, which is often a very strong policy interest because women often have stopping rules uh, for desired family sizes. We know this because they tell us they do. And uh, so this is uh, something of, of interest as well. And I'm gonna ask you to do this in the homework problem. Those of you taking the course uh, will be uh, forced through it. Uh, those of you um, who are just auditing or watching this even years later, uh, the solutions are up on the website, and I encourage you to take a look. There's a lot to learn in the uh, for the details of this, but it doesn't involve all of this uh, varying effects shenanigans. It's just high-level thinking about how to properly stratify by a cause of interest. Uh, age has a similar set of issues. Um, notice that to, to estimate the effect of kids, uh, we're going to have to simultaneously stratify by age, because obviously age is a strong influence on how many surviving children a woman has. Um, and age, similarly, as a variable, uh, often can have strong uh, and awkward functional relationships to other variables. Final thing uh, in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this lecture and the previous, I haven't done the synthetic data simulation and testing of the golems, and I apologize for that. But there's just no way to pack it all in. And one of the reasons um, is that. For this kind of example, these kinds of demographic uh, population examples, uh, a satisfying synthetic data simulation could be quite complicated. Yeah, I mean, so when we say that age influences the number of surviving kids we have, obviously that's not linear, 
right? Um, because at least for humans, uh, the, the, the range of years that a woman is fertile is a tiny proportion of her life. And so you don't expect some linear relationship between age and number of kids, right? There's some distribution of age at first reproduction, and then there are interbirth intervals. And a synthetic data simulation in these demographic scenarios is not a trivial thing, actually. Uh, and in many of the previous examples in synthetic data simulation, I have sort of uh, made trivial by just making it look like the stat model. But in this case, that's not going to be adequate. Um, and so I've punted on it. Um, I might give you a homework problem in which I ask you to make an attempt at this. But I just want to make it clear um, that test that synthetic data simulation and testing is just as important in these scenarios. It's just harder. And sometimes it's the hardest part because you're doing, uh, well, an agent-based population simulation, uh, essentially. There was one example of this earlier in the course when I showed the Clutter Bias example of marriage and happiness that I used an agent-based simulation in that case to generate a cross-sectional sample. Uh, to show you how the collider bias can arise. We need a similar sort of issue here where we have a dynamic simulation and we draw a cross-section from it uh, because we have a cross-sectional sample. All right, let me try to sum up. Um, this lecture has been about correlated varying effects, which is one of the sort of standard artistic techniques, if you'll allow me that, uh, of doing uh, Bayesian statistical modeling. Um, and it's this feature, actually, which has drawn a lot of people to Bayes just because uh, this is the most effective way to fit such models, and these sorts of models have lots of advantages. So all philosophy aside, um, in the behavioral sciences and biological sciences, um, the, the growth of Bayesian statistics has been driven in large part by how much easier it is to fit these correlated varying effects models using Bayes than using um, other techniques like maximum likelihood. What's the point of them? Well, they contain priors that learn correlation structure, and this has two uh, strong advantages. First, um, it gives us partial pooling across features, which can sometimes substantially improve estimates. And second, it learns the correlations. We get a posterior distribution for the correlations among features, and sometimes the research question is about that. And in the uh, lecture next week, uh, I will have an example of that, so just hang on. Um, <clears throat> I wanna remind you, I, I mentioned this already in the lecture, Varying effects in the posterior can be correlated even if the prior doesn't learn the correlation. So the, uh, if you use a varying effects model with uncorrelated, um, uncorrelated features, uh, it's not the end of the world. And you can still learn uh, that there are correlations. You just won't have a parameter for it, and you won't get partial pooling. So you're giving up a little bit. Um, the best thing to do is to use correlated varying effects in almost all cases, unless you've got some exotic argument otherwise. Uh, sometimes it's technically not feasible. We all understand that. But I want to point out, and this is going to be you know, sort of my uh, open science dad persona now, it is an ethical obligation to use the best methodological techniques that we know. Uh, it is not okay to say, well, it's just going to turn out the same or we didn't have time. That is not a justification, yeah. Especially if you're publicly funded, right? If you're if you're privately funded and you, you answer to somebody else, but if you're publicly funded, you answer to posterity, uh, and it is an ethical violation to ignore the best methods that you know. Okay, thanks for your indulgence. Uh, this has been week seven of Statistical Rethinking 2023. And next week, we're going to get more specialized. I'm going to start out, uh, I call it multi-level tactics on this slide, but we're going to start out with a whole lecture about social network analysis. And I hope to see you there. I was sitting in the rain the other day, getting soaked, watching those football players play. My team was losing, so it wasn't even funny. And old dumb me, I bet all my rent money. I got so shook. I could hardly even talk. So I got my base and we went for a walk. We started walking. Are you still there? I'll give you a bonus. So I avoided a lot of the detail in the lecture and the previous one about why this non centering of multi level priors helps with sampling from the posterior distribution. Uh, so I'm reminding you by showing you the slide here that uh, 
uh, we had some inefficiency in the correlated features model, in particular the standard deviations for the features sampled inefficiently and had low numbers of effective uh, samples relative to the total samples and higher R hats than the other uh, parameters. In this particular case, this isn't a major problem. Uh, we still get uh, a sufficiently accurate picture of the posterior distribution. Um, and if you ran the chains longer, uh, the statistics would look better. Uh, but sometimes for more complicated models, uh, you really can't fix things just by running the chains longer. Uh, and you're going to get some biased samples from the posterior distribution uh, as a consequence of this inefficiency. And so that's why the non-centering is an essential skill to make this stuff work. And some software packages like um, the excellent BRMS and RSTAN ARM, which also rely upon STAN, uh, use non-centered multi-level priors as their default. Um, but sometimes centered priors are better uh, than non-centered priors. It all depends upon the details. So in this bonus round, I'd like to explain the principles behind this transformation, give you a better idea how it works. Um, uh, but I want to reassure you that you don't have to completely understand the mathematical basis of why this works in order to make good use of the two different forms of priors. You can switch between them and you need to know both of them. <clears throat> the basic reason that multi-level priors uh, are often hard to uh, or construct posterior distributions that are harder to sample from is that they construct uh, surfaces, that is posterior distributions, with steeper curvature. Once you start embedding um, parameters on top of other parameters, you can get very rapid changes in the plausibility of the observations and you can get what is effectively a very steep um, uh, skate park uh, and with vertical walls almost in some places. And it's harder to explore or to, or to do a Hamiltonian simulation on such, such surfaces because you have to use very fine small steps in the uh, simulation in order to follow the steep curvature. Uh, you risk essentially punching through the wall of the skate park. And I'm going to show you some animations in a moment to give you an intuition about this. Uh, when this happens, when you essentially punch through the wall of the skate park in the Hamiltonian simulation, um, the simulation will usually detect it. Uh, and it will report something at the end of your model run uh, called divergent transitions. And each of these divergent transitions is a rejection of a proposal that was caused by one of these inaccurate simulations. Uh, to remind you, um, the Hamiltonian uh, is the uh, total energy of the, of the physical system that's being simulated, and so it has to remain constant at, from the start to the end of the trajectory that we simulate in the Hamiltonian skate park that is our uh, negative log posterior distribution. And so um, the algorithm detects uh, inaccurate simulations by monitoring the value of the Hamiltonian and if it's different at the end than it was at the start then something went wrong and then we're uh, likely to reject that proposal. Um, however if there are regions of the posterior uh, which are very hard to explore because they're steep and you get lots of divergent transitions whenever the trajectory wanders into them then you can't sample from those regions and that's that's no good. Uh, and this is when transforming the priors can help because it ends up transforming the geometry of the bowl we're trying to roll around in. Uh, so I'm going to show you some uh, simple examples and then we'll return to the example from the lecture briefly. Uh, and the goal here is just to give you both uh, some intuition for why this works, um, uh, some uh, deeper understanding of what these uh, scary sounding divergent transitions are. Um, if you're like me, uh, it sounds like a good thing. You like divergent things and you like transitions, but uh, maybe most people don't like the sound of divergent transition. It sounds bad. Sometimes called divergent trajectories, yeah. Um, but you shouldn't be scared of them. You just need to understand that they're rejected and they're rejected probably, they're rejected proposals and they're rejected probably because of some steep curvature in some region. Okay. Uh, here's a posterior distribution. Uh, we're looking down on it, like in these other sorts of diagrams like this, uh, for, in its uh, posterior distribution for two 
completely arbitrary parameters that I've made up, x on the horizontal and v on the vertical. And there's no data in this example. We're just trying to sample from essentially a prior distribution. But remember, priors and posteriors are the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's kind of an illusion of our mind to, to think that they're different. Um, and I show you on the right of this slide uh, the uh, uh, probability assignments that define um, this uh, particular skate park there where it's, it's deepest in the middle where you see the simulation rolling around. And then it has these very steep walls on the bottom. So V has a normal distribution um, it was, uh, centered on zero with a standard deviation of a half. And then x, uh, the horizontal axis variable, uh, also has a normal distribution uh, centered on zero, but its standard deviation is a function of v. And as a consequence, as v gets small towards the bottom, the standard deviation gets small. I'll say that again. As v gets small towards the bottom of the graph, the standard deviation on x gets small. And this creates this very narrow valley that contracts towards the bottom. Yeah, or a funnel, it's often called in this literature. In the textbook, I call this the devil's funnel. It's particularly wicked and difficult to sample from. Um, and I'll show you some examples of what can happen when it, this thing wanders down in there. If we make it even narrower now, yeah, by changing the standard deviation of V, uh, we can make this more or less pernicious. As the standard deviation of V grows large, the devil's funnel can get arbitrarily narrow um, and uh, your simulation wanders down in there, it's likely to crash into the wall. So let me show you what will happen uh, when we make um, the, the standard deviation on V3 instead of uh, 0.5. Now the, the devil's funnel down there at the bottom is very narrow, and when our um, virtual skateboarder wanders into it, you see that the little line segments are the how fine uh, those are the steps in the trajectory of the Hamiltonian simulation that approximate the smooth path of actual physics. And um, when he gets into the, the deep funnel there, he starts moving faster, and those trajectories are not, the, the, or rather the line segments are not small enough to stop him from just punching through the wall, and then weird physical results happen like he's launched into space. As you'll see again as the animation repeats. See there, he's in orbit. Nope, orbit again. Yeah. And uh, the red points are the rejected proposals. And so the, the chain starts over after such a rejection, um, but this is inefficient in the first place. And second, if you can't ever uh, draw samples from the funnel, then you don't know what its shape is. Remember, when we're actually running a Markov chain, we can't see the surface. That's why we're running the Markov chain. I've just chosen a simple example where we can actually draw the surface so you can see what's going on. Uh, the other thing that can happen is you can get stuck in the funnel, as you'll see the simulation is doing here. It has a hard time getting out as well. Okay. So this is what happens in a multi-level prior because a multi-level prior, a centered version of a multi-level prior, has parameters inside of it and a parameter for the standard deviation. And um, that's the kind of thing that can make uh, this happen. Oh yeah, the red points are the divergent transitions. So I showed you that. Okay, why do these uh, divergent transitions happen? Um, uh, the basic problem is when there's uh, when there are big changes in the curvature of the posterior in different regions of it, like in the example on the screen here, the same step size for the Hamiltonian simulation is not optimal everywhere. You want really fine steps when you're in the funnel, and you want bigger steps when you're out of it. There's this kind of uh, big, smooth, safe plane to cruise on once you get out of the funnel, but um, the algorithm uses the same step size everywhere. Um, so what can you do? Well, you can use a smaller step size, uh, or you can reparameterize, uh, or you can do both. Okay, small step size can work, but th this results in incredibly slow exploration, right? So in the smooth part up there, um, you're just taking forever to explore. So it's inefficient for another reason now, uh, but it can handle the funnel better, right? Because it, it actually does the, uh, doesn't punch through the walls, it just rolls off of them because it's got a smaller smooth simulation, you see. Um, the other option is this uh, non-centering trick that I had showed you but not really explained in any satisfactory way in this lecture and the previous one. So here's the devil's funnel again. Uh, it's in the centered version of it. Now we're going to make the non-centered version of the devil's funnel. Uh, and that means uh, take the parameters out of x, out of the prior for x. How can we do that? Well, we redefine x as a deterministic function of some new parameter. Let's choose it. Let's call it z. 
that's my that's my go-to choice or Z if you prefer and um, we're going to assign a Z a um, standard normal uh, prior distribution this is a great choice because this makes a very nice skate bowl um, for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, normal distributions are easy to skate on and because um, they're they're parabolas uh, in the in the um, minus log probability space they're perfect parabolas and then we convert back um, so uh, x is equal to uh, z uh, uh, times uh, e to the v yeah and this gives us um, the, the x we want yeah so this is essentially saying there's some for any x that we might draw from the prior we really want that is the normal uh, with a mean of zero and uh, exponent v um, that x will have some z score right it'll have some standardized value we, we get by um, dividing by the standard deviation that is dividing by exponent v so since we divided by exponent v to get the z score we can get back to x just by multiplying by exponent v i'll say that again since we get the z score by dividing x by exponent v which is the standard deviation of the x distribution we get back to x from the z score by multiplying the z score by exponent v which just means e to the v and that is the non-centering trick it's the same trick that i showed you in lecture um, it's just a little simpler here because there's no mean to subtract as well as the mean is zero so what does that do in this case well now uh, the hamiltonian monte carlo doesn't have to sample from anything with a funnel it's uh, got two normal distributions one with a standard deviation of three and the other with a standard deviation of one and it can cruise around very nicely in this because it's just a parabolic bowl, uh, parabolic bowl uh, to skate around in and on the right of this slide i'll show you a simulation with two skaters a blue and a purple and um, uh, they occasionally collide with one another but the simulation doesn't care this would be like two chains when you run your markov chain uh, the chains run in parallel in the same surface ignoring one another taking samples uh, from the same surface like this and this is a very easy uh, these multi-dimensional gaussian posteriors are easy to sample from um, works very nice so if you can transform it uh, transform your hard problem with uh, the devil's funnel into an easy problem with a big uh, gaussian bowl uh, that's often the best way to go so you can play with this with ulam you can program the devil's funnel directly into it and this is this example is also in the book um, and uh, you just program the devil's funnel directly into it notice there's no data here right uh, you can just sample from priors using ulam and uh, in the first version m13.7 um, the centered version of the devil's funnel you get a bunch of divergent transitions yeah and uh, the nf of 7 for v that's not great and an r hat of 1.4 that's big i've done worse before i've had r hats of 20. Um, i think that's my record around 20. and uh, anyway that's not a reliable uh, uh, you wouldn't trust that posterior distribution i hope and um, but the bottom one uh, which remember uh, we get the same samples uh, for v and x that we want it's just that x is a computed quantity from z now right it's we sample and then we transform in the non-centered version in the centered version we sample or rather we transform and then we sample and in the non-centered version we sample and then we transform and uh, often uh, well each of these is better in different circumstances uh, but uh, often the uh, transforming at the end after sampling is easier let's see what these chains look like just to convince you how bad uh, the devil's funnel can be so here's the centered version uh, these are bad chains they are not exploring the same space yeah um, and then here's the trace plot for the centered version with the auxiliary parameter x uh, in there so v and z are perfect uh, uh, fuzzy caterpillars exactly the kind of trace plot you want to see good uh, numbers of effective parameters good r hats um, and then x down there is the transformed version and you might think that's a uh, a weird looking um, trace plot but that's exactly the distribution of x and the reason is because x sticks to a very tight range but then when it gets in the uh, uh, it can have these it has a very long tail right and that's what those excursions are out in probability space that's a consequence of the exponentiation <coughs> okay okay so here's the example from lecture uh, with the contraception model 
and the centered version on the left and the non-centered version on the right. And the non-centered version has this weird line in it that I declined to explain where there's some matrix algebra. So let's spend some time on that matrix algebra line now. If you're not familiar with matrix algebra, that's okay. Just kind of hum along and acquaint yourself with the function of this line and what it's meant to do and not with the detailed calculations because your computer will take care of that and do a better job than we ever could. Um, so what does this V equals uh, diag sigma LZ uh, um, transpose? That little, that little weird T means to transpose, which is like rotating the matrix. Uh, what does this mean? So V is a matrix of varying effects, remember, and um, the first column of which is the are the varying effect offsets for the alphas. So we just get back on the scale by adding the mean to them. And the second column of V is, are the varying effect offsets for the betas, and we get back on to the standard scale by adding the mean back to them. And then we can use our same old linear model at the top as always. Um, so it this matrix algebra, this nasty bundle of matrix algebra here, just takes the standardized uncorrelated z-scores, um, uh, z-scores exactly in the same spirit of the z-score in the non-centered devil's funnel, and puts them back on the unstandardized scale. And in this case, it's not only that they're unstandardized, so we're, we're getting the standard deviations uh, back in, multiplying again by the proper standard deviations, but we're also producing correlations between the features by putting correlations back in. Um, and that's the weird thing about the, about the multivariate uh, non-centered parameterization, is there's a way that we actually factor out correlations, and then we have to put them back in. And there's a great trick to this. Um, so let me step through this one piece at a time, demystify it a bit. So V is a 61 by 2 matrix because there are 61 districts and um, two features. If you had more features, there would be more columns. If you had more districts, there would be more rows. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing inside this is uh, what's called a diagonal matrix. That's what the, that diag um, function was on the previous slide. It just takes a vector and it uh, spreads that vector along the diagonal of the matrix, making a square matrix of the same dimension as the length of the vector. And so for the vector of two standard deviations, we end up with a two by two matrix where the standard deviations are on the diagonal, just like this with sigma one and sigma two being the standard deviations of the two features. Uh, then we have this thing L, and this is our magic ingredient. This is the Koleski factor uh, of the correlation matrix across features. And I'll say a little bit more about this before. Um, but it's actually just sufficient to understand that it's something you compute from a correlation matrix. Every correlation matrix implies a unique Koleski factor, and uh, that Koleski factor can be used algebraically to um, sort of encode the correlation structure in a very efficient way. And then we can uh, put this stuff back in there, uh, get the correlations back in using it with this um, equation. Uh, Capital Z here is the 2 by 61 matrix of z-scores. Remember, every element of this has exactly the same prior, and there are no correlations. All right? That's the big multidimensional Gaussian bowl we'd like to cruise around in. And then again, this little t means to transpose, so that the result of all of that matrix algebra on the right-hand side of the equals is to produce a 2 by 61 matrix, the same dimension as Z. But for convenience, we prefer to have the districts um, on the rows and the features on the on the columns, and so I just rotate it. But obviously that's not essential as long as you keep straight, which, which uh, margin means what. So what is this Koleski thing? Uh, Koleski was a man, uh, and uh, uh, Koleski is pretty obviously a Polish name, but um, he was a French citizen, and he fought in the First World War on the side of the French. And uh, he came up with this, he was an artillery commander, and he came up with this ingenious method, uh, I think during the war, actually, um, for solving systems of linear equations. And that's where this Koleski factor comes in. It's an incredibly practical and useful method. In fact, it was used in, um, uh, in geography, uh, I think, first, not really artillery. Um, so here's, here's the blow up part of it. If your French isn't, isn't that great, I took French in high school and my French is now absolutely terrible, but uh, here's my, my struggled attempt at translating the relevant bits of this. Uh, this. The title of this paper, it was actually communicated by another commandant, Commandant, commandant uh, Benoit, and uh, 
It says it wrote this paper a note note on a method for solving normal equations resulting from the application of the method of least squares to a system of linear equations of smaller number than the unknowns. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? This is what math papers are like. They have very descriptive uh, titles. There's really no poetry here. Um, there's more poetry in the introduction to this paper, which is one of the best introductions to a mathematical paper I've ever read. And it begins, the artillery commander, uh, Koleski, or almost certainly Sholeski, they would have said, of the geographical service of the army, killed during the Great War, imagined, during research on the compensation of the geodesic networks, a very ingenious process of solving the equations known as normal, obtained by application of the method of the least squares to linear equations in lower number than that of the unknowns. Okay, it's a long sentence. Uh, the, Point is, uh, this fellow, uh, André Louis Cholesky, came up with a very, very clever thing. And it is now a workhorse um, way to factor matrices to do very practical linear algebra chores. And I want to show you, <clears throat> your computer is going to take care of this for you. You can just, uh, you can give R any correlation matrix and just ask it for the Cholesky factor and it'll do it. So you don't ever have to calculate these things by hand. Um, but I just want to demystify it a bit by showing you uh, what it's doing. Eventually what the Koleski factor is doing is it knows exactly which, um, to get correlations into uh, a matrix of variables, it knows exactly how much of the other variables to mix into the others and in what amounts. Uh, and it, it knows how much because you told it how much through the correlation matrix, but then it, it figures out the most efficient equation for doing this. So that's what we, here's this world's simplest um, Koleski correlation blending example. We're going to define a, a two dimensional Gaussian distribution where the two variables have a correlation of 0.6. It's a pretty strong correlation, but the, the amount doesn't matter. Um, and uh, I'm going to give the first one a standard deviation of 2 and the second a standard deviation of 0.5. Uh, but I'm going to build up this two dimensional Gaussian by sampling independent z scores for each. So z1 is our first variable, and this is just. Um, uh, independent normals, uh, 0, 1. If you don't tell our uh, arguments for R norm, it assumes 0, 1. And Z2 the same. So these are independent now. This is a So Z1 and Z2 form um, a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution where there's no correlation, and they have the same standard deviation of 1. But now, using the Koleski factor um, for a, a two-dimensional uh, correlation matrix with a correlation of 0.6, uh, we blend them back together. And the way we do this, we get our first variable by just taking the first z-score and putting it back on its its, stand, its unstandardized scale by multiplying it by its standard deviation. So that's all the line at the bottom here is. Yeah, a1 is equal to z1, its z-score, times its standard deviation. So there's nothing mystical about that, right? So this is how these things always start. But then the second one needs to be infiltrated a bit uh, by the first. Um, so this one's a function of both z-scores. So we have um, the correlation rho, which is 0.6 in this example, times uh, the first z-score. So this is mixing in uh, uh, the other variable, uh, plus the square root of 1 minus uh, rho um, squared times z2. And you're asking yourself, where does this weird square root 1 minus rho squared come from? That's from the Koleski factor. Uh, you factor the correlation matrix, and it tells you that that's the right factor to use to reconstruct the correlation. And then we take that whole sum and we multiply it by the proper scale for the second dimension. And you can try this code out and I'll show you the output on the right of this slide. It really works. And it works with bigger um, uh, correlation matrices as well. There's nothing special about the two-dimensional case. It's just that the Koleski factor in the two-dimensional case is exactly this simple. It's really, really simple. It's more complicated for bigger matrices, but the principle is the same. Okay. I hope that was uh, educational. Uh, if not entertaining, a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of history. Um, the practical lesson to take from this is that both the centered version of a multi-level prior and the non-centered version are better in different contexts. So you can't just always decide to use the non-centered version, although quite often that's your best default. Um, and the reason is that the, the centered version will actually sample more efficiently when uh, the probability of the data is dominant, and that happens when you have a lot of data in each cluster. So if we had, in this example, in each district, we had a very, very large sample of women such that there was very little partial pooling or a lot less partial pooling, then the prior wouldn't matter as much as the data. And in that case, the centered version actually can sample um, uh, much more efficiently in some cases.
and you can actually get divergences if you use um, the non-centered version in that case. <clears throat> Um, and in contrast, uh, like the example in the lecture, the non-centered version tends to be better when there are many clusters and there's sparse evidence in some number of them. In this case, the prior is dominant, at least for some dimensions of the posterior distribution, and then we're likely to get those uh, things like the devil's funnel. Okay, I'll see you next week where we'll talk about uh, social network modeling, and that's certainly an application where we need to use non-centered priors most of the time. I'll see you there.